think it should be recording now. Okay, good. Yeah, so, uh, so some of that front end of that lecture, I guess we've lost, but fortunately it's just, I just was uh, in that first part of the lecture, we were just explaining what we we're gonna do today. And what we're gonna do today is talk about functional groups, alcohols and, and nitro groups and esters. So I'm gonna bring up my reflector page here and share my reflector page. This is basically what I just said in the introduction. Alcohols, esters, and nitro groups are the first three functional groups that we're gonna learn in organic chemistry. Now notice this is something you've not seen before. Look at this letter R, R-O-H. Now the OH group means it's an alcohol. Uh, some other people are trying to get in. Go back. And come back. I'm gonna have to stop this uh, waiting room here. I don't know why I put that waiting room in there, but that was sort of a, a pain. All right, so let me go back to our um, notepad. And lastly, we'll talk about nitro organics. If we have any people who are our uh, drag race aficionados. Um, I grew up near a drag strip up on Long Island in New York, and my dad used to take me to uh, the racetrack quite a bit. So I got to know the smell of uh, nitro fuel, top fuel dragsters pretty well when I was a kid. Now, continuing on, let's go ahead and talk about alcohols for a minute. That'll be the first one we do. So I'm gonna get my uh, pencil here real quick. And the first thing we'll do is we'll talk about methyl alcohol, CH3OH. Now, the first thing to note about methyl alcohol and all alcohols in general is there is a very polar bond right there. So you remember water, H2O. H2O had a very, very, very polar bond. Delta plus, delta minus. Remember that delta means partial, partially positive, partially negative. Delta, I know that looks like a squiggly S. That, that's just a lowercase delta. The vector arrow always goes from the positive to the negative. Why is oxygen negative? It's the most electronegative of that pair of atoms. Now, will I ever ask you to know that? No, you will not. What I will ask you to do is to know how to read the table of electronegativities. So I give you the table and all you gotta know is the bigger the number, the higher the electronegativity. And remember, it's not the absolute Neg electronegativity of any one particular atom that's particularly important to us. What's most important to us is delta chi of the H O bond. Chi is electronegativity, by the way. You look at learning a lot of Greek letters here. Delta chi is this bond. Hydrogen is 2.1, oxygen is 3.5. So delta chi is 1.4. As I mentioned, when we talked about water, that's a huge difference in electronegativity. So methanol, methyl alcohol, by the way, that's, I just said the same thing twice. Methanol, methyl, alcohol, they mean the same thing. They, it is very, very polar extremely polar. So methanol is completely miscible with water because remember water is very polar too. In general chemistry, you learned that like dissolves like. Polar things dissolve into polar things. So small alcohols, that's a key here, by the way. Small things dissolve, small alcohols dissolve into water because there are two parts 
of alcohols. We have this carbon hydrogen part, which is very nonpolar. And then we have the OH part, which is very polar. In the case for small alcohols, this is, this is a, an easy situation. The thing in the red dominates. It completely dominates the, the polarity. So this molecule is completely, do you remember the word miscible? M-I-S-S-I-B-L-E, miscible. Miscible means that you are completely soluble in all percentages with that other thing. So 1% methanol in 99% water, completely miscible. 99% methanol, 1% water, completely miscible. You will only see one phase in that uh, uh, liquid. It'll just look clear. Now let's get to the second alcohol now. The second alcohol, another fuel, by the way, Methanol as a fuel is typically used in race cars. Okay, um, I'll show you. I'll show you a drum of race car fuel in a minute. Now, B ethyl alcohol, CH three, CH two, OH, or another way to write ethyl alcohol is like this. Do you remember our line notation? Anywhere a bond terminates, that's a C. So this carbon out here has only one bond to it. It needs three more. So the others are hydrogens. This bond here, that carbon atom there, anywhere you see two lines intersect, that's a carbon atom. That carbon atom is attached to two things, a carbon and an oxygen. So that bond needs two. So what you don't see there are these H's out here. Just like here, I don't show you the H's in the line notation. Now, again, you don't show the H's unless, you don't show the H's unless the H is on a heteroatom. Heteroatom, remember, is an atom that's not carbon. Well, that oxygen atom is attached to the, uh, that hydrogen atom is attached to the oxygen atom. So therefore we have to show that hydrogen. You do have to draw in that one, okay? So there's the, the line notation for ethyl alcohol. And again, oh, let me, let me draw you the word ethanol. Or another way to say that, Ethyl alcohol. Two ways to say the same thing. Now, ethanol as a fuel, let, let's, let's not talk about it as a beverage. Uh, I think we all know what ethanol comes from. We get that from fermentation of grain. So if you are making beer, you're going to ferment uh, uh, barley. Uh, or some people like wheat beer, and, and I don't like the wheat beer. But some people drink that. That's from wheat. Ferment the wheat. You make wheat beer, vice beer. Uh, some people, depending upon what country you're in, they, they get their starch. It's, it's only starch that we're interested in. Starch can come from a lot of places. So barley has starch. Wheat has starch. Potatoes have starch. So if you take potatoes and you add yeast and you ferment potatoes, you can make uh, vodka. You know, if you're from Russia or Poland, you know this very well. Um, now that alcohol, you do have to distill. That's called the distilled spirit. Uh, whiskey, the grains there, again, barley, uh, you, you make whiskeys from and, and so forth. So the source of the starch is unimportant. You take that starch source and eventually you break apart the starch to make a simple sugar called glucose. Then the yeast turns the glucose into alcohol. That's called biosynthesis. And a lot of ethanol is made by the fermentation of, of grain. But a lot of, most of the alcohol for fuel does not come from a fermentation 
of either corn, corn is a big one in the United States, by the way, the starch that we get from corn is, because is, we're, we're very good at growing corn. We, we can make a lot of corn. And so therefore we get that. If you're from Brazil, uh, they have a lot of sugar cane. And so they have huge amounts of ethanol that they make from sugar cane. So, and, and matter of fact, if you go down to Brazil, a lot of the cars just, just use straight ethyl alcohol in their engines. And it's a good fuel, um, cleaner than regular gasoline, I can tell you that. Now, but a lot of the ethanol that we get is synthetic. So you, you have these petroleum products that we turn into ethyl alcohol. Very, very important uh, in our fuel system. And, and we'll have more to talk about that in just a minute. Now, I'm gonna skip propanol for a minute and let's get to butanol. Because butanol, one, two, three, four, now I go OH, four carbons, CH3, CH2, Here's CH3 out here. Here's CH2, 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 O, and again, the hydrogen is on the oxygen. This is butyl alcohol or butanol. Butanol is one of those alcohols that we can genetically engineer some uh, bacteria to make in high quantities. So butanol has come on as an alternative fuel, and, and we'll see that. Um, you know, later on, uh, where, where when we start talking about biochemistry, we'll see how butanol can be made from microbes. And again, a very good fuel, uh, you, a gasoline engine can run it, just like ethanol can be run in a gasoline engine. Now you gotta be careful here. Uh, too much ethanol in a normal gasoline engine will damage it. There are certain components, basically the, the, the the rubbers and the silicon components that the ethanol can chew up. Um, if you have a Ford flex vehicle, Ford Motor Company, and uh, you, you can use any combination of ethanol you want, because just like methanol, ethanol is completely miscible with water. We have the polar part. Here again is my polar part of ethyl alcohol. And here's my nonpolar part of ethyl alcohol. So again, in this case, the polar part still dominates the overall polarity of the ethanol molecule. Very soon we're gonna see some alcohols where that blue part, the nonpolar part becomes the dominant part. And therefore that those alcohols will not dissolve in water but ethanol still dissolves completely in water. So if you, if you hold up, uh, maybe you sneak into your parents' liquor cabinet and you hold up a bottle of vodka to the light, you will see that that ethyl alcohol is completely miscible. You don't see two layers. You don't see alcohol floating on top of the water layer. It's all one phase because those two are miscible because both are polar like dissolves like. All right, now here's the bad part about ethanol and methanol as fuels. So remember we just talked about this desire for water? Well, water in an engine is not a good thing. So if you're not turning over your gasoline, let's say you have a boat, that you only use once or twice a month. So that gasoline is sitting in the engine for long periods of time. What can happen is moisture from the air. Remember, as the night comes down, the air gets cool, you condense moisture from the outside and that water can get into the fuel. That's not a good thing. And so you can get a uh, damage to components with older gasoline that has ethanol in it. Now, in my boat, I actually go to a gasoline station that sells non-alcohol gasoline. It's more expensive, but I don't have to worry about water as much. 
water damaging my fuel in my boat. So that's good because I only get out on the boat a couple times a month. Uh, matter of fact, I'm not getting out at all right now. I should probably just dump all the fuel out of that boat now. Okay, so continuing on, we've talked about butanol now. Now here's where we start talking about the transition at carbon four. Here's the nonpolar part of butyl alcohol. And here's the polar part, nonpolar. Polar. The nonpolar part hates the water. The polar part hates the uh, loves the water. So you see, we have a disconnect here. So butanol is what we call partially soluble. So you might get maybe half of the butyl alcohol to dissolve into the water, but the other half of the butyl alcohol floats. So butanol is a fuel that is at that transition zone. Now, once we pass butanol and we get into propanol, hexanol, heptanol, octanol, nonol, decanol, those things, the alcohol just floats on top of the water. Even though it's an alcohol, there's just too much nonpolar part. Uh, so that ends up dominating the whole process. Okay, now let me show you real quick. Stop that share. I want to pull up a picture here for a second. I'm going to share my screen, different screen. Oh, that's not the one I want. Okay. You can, you can, you can go out. Anybody can, and you can buy a couple of uh, jugs of racing fuel. Um, notice I want to show you two things in this racing fuel. You see this thing, it says unleaded and leaded. So again, methanol, you would not put this in your car uh, because this is really for specialized pur uh, purposes. So this, is, this is more for uh, racing fuel, for race cars. Now, unleaded is just like your gasoline. There's no leaded uh, in there. So what is, what is leaded and unleaded? What is, the, what is the purpose of lead in gasoline? Well, lead is an anti-knock compound. Uh, a lot of you, unless you're real car junkies, you don't know what knocking is, but you probably have heard it before. So if you have a, a car or a motorcycle, uh, my, my BMW, uses high test fuel because if I don't, if I don't, if I use just regular fuel in my motorcycle, it knocks. What it what is knocking? Knocking in an engine, a car engine, is a premature detonation. So in a car engine, the piston rises up, it takes that mixture of fuel and air, and it compresses it. As it gets up to the top of the cylinder, the spark from the, from the distributor goes down the wire and it ignites that mixture of fuel and air. And that creates a lot of gas. That's basically the way the piston gets forced to the bottom and turns the crank, which then turns your tires. But what would happen if you squeeze the air and the fuel and it ignites before it gets to the top of the piston, before the spark ignites it, that's called premature detonation. Premature detonation is basically knocking. That is not good for an engine. So if you have a car that needs high test, do not use regular gas in there, especially if you're, you start hearing, uh, you know, bang, 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 bang in your engine. That's a very bad, bad thing to do. Uh, now, in the old days, they used to put lead in there to keep that from happening. Now, lead metal? No, not lead metal. Tetraethyl lead. It's an organometallic compound. Three ethyl groups. Uh, I'm sorry, four ethyl groups. Remember ethyl? CH3, CH2. Two carbons. 
four ethyl groups surrounding the lead. Lead is PB. Remember lead? It's a heavy metal. It's poisonous. Uh, the little airplanes that I fly, the C-152s, the Warriors, the Cherokees, the 172s, those airplanes use leaded fuel, not very environmentally sound. Uh, uh, fortunately, I don't fly as much as I used to, partly because of my environmental activism. You know, I just cannot stand lead in the environment. But that is a source of the lead in these racing fuels, tetraethyl lead, to keep that motor from detonating. Now, these fuels have another additive that is not, remember, they're both, this is 100. You, you, you know the, the octane value in fuel? If you go to the pump, look at the pump next time. You know, 80 octane, 90 octane, 100 octane. Um, here's 110 octane. So that gives you the, the octane rating of the fuel, okay? So these are in turn, and by the way, we're, this document is in the Moodle page. So if you're a motorhead like I am, and you enjoy race cars, you should, you should kind of browse around here. It, it's kind of good to learn about the fuels that you use. Um, so here's the methanol, and sometimes it can attack aluminum parts. So that's not good. So again, even though, uh, Methyl alcohol, see I'm circling methyl alcohol right here. Methyl alcohol is, is not a um, very acidic stuff, but it still can degrade aluminum parts. So, uh, and that'll damage aluminum components. Um, now, again, you, you get these different races, you know, whether the Champs or Monster Truck or USAC, Sprint Cars, Midgets, they all use methanol, pure methanol. Uh, when you get up to other cars where they start using uh, nitro fuels, we'll talk about that in a minute. All right, so here's a, some stuff about ethyl alcohol as being a fuel. You should probably, I, I would say before, uh, I, and I may go ahead and throw a, a, a homework question or two from these videos. So what I think might not be a bad idea is for you this weekend, to pull up this page, remember it's it's in your it's in the Moodle page underneath the the chapter the first section, and then just click on these links and and browse through them. All right. So again, it, it's a, it's a fuel, it's a beverage, uh, it's a lot of things, but it has good fuel value. Uh, they give you some equivalencies here. Is it good as good as gasoline? No, it's not. Uh, you you would have to use more ethanol to get the same amount of gasoline value, but it's much less dirty, okay? Here's that thing in Brazil where almost all of their vehicles use ethyl alcohol, which is great. Bioethanol comes from a renewable feedstock. So if you get your ethanol from corn, that's a renewable feedstock. In Brazil, if you get your bioethanol from sugar, that's a renewable feedstock. So those are all great. Um, some people are using ethanol as a replacement for cooking. Um, a lot of poor people, they will burn almost anything. They will burn garbage. They will burn, you know, really bad, you know, peat or coal. And, and if you're cooking inside a closed area, that, that really is a, a, a health hazard to people who are in poor communities. So, you know, you know Ghana, Ethiopia, Nigeria, Brazil, Haiti, Madagascar, they're all using uh, ethanol in terms of replacing that for a cooking fuel. Uh, oh no, biodiesel, not yet. I'll talk about that in a minute. So let me get off that page, stop that share. Now, let's go ahead and talk about another substitute for a dirty fuel. Let's talk about a substitute for diesel fuel. And I think I had mentioned last class that I make this fuel at my house. And I'll tell you, yeah, I have a PhD in chemistry, but you know what? To make this fuel is easier than baking a cake. There's only three ingredients. It's trivial. And you can substitute uh, a fuel that will make a new fuel, which is far less toxic, far less environmentally damaging, and, and basically can uh, mitigate 
a, a waste product, which is basically cooking fuel, cooking oil. So uh, we'll see that in just a moment. So let me go ahead and get back to my uh, Moodle page here real quick. Actually, let me, let me, let me, let me put up uh, this page instead. So I want to next talk about, oh, I need to add a page, sorry. So I next want to talk about um, uh, B, esters, as a functional group. What is it that makes an ester an ester? On the previous page, I showed you R, C double bond, O, O, R prime. R just means variable. It could be anything. It could be CH3. It could be CH3, CH2, CH2, CH2. It could be anything. So esters are basically this group. That's what makes an ester. C double bond O, O, R. This is the second functional group that you have learned in organic chemistry. Esters play a vital role in biology. The triesters of an alcohol called glycerol are found in, in many fats and oils. So things like uh, cooking oil from vegetable oil, uh, lard, you know lard, right? The, the fat you get from hogs, more like Crisco. Crisco is another oil. That's, a, that's something that we find. Now those are triesters, sometimes called triglycerides. Triesters, triglycerides are the same synonymous. Maybe if you've had a blood test recently, you saw that you had a triglyceride number. How much fat is in your blood? Let me just show you a picture of a triglyceride, a cartoon picture. That's a fat. Whether you are peanut oil, olive oil, uh, butter, lard, I don't care. They're all fats. They're all triesters. Comprised of two uh, units. The blue unit is called glycerol. It's a tri-alcohol. The red units are called fatty acids. And they're all hooked together. Now, to make biodiesel, to make a fuel that is compatible with diesel engines, all you need to do is you need to take whatever fat you want. Now, where do I get my fat? I get my fat from a restaurant in Raleigh, a, a, a pub known as the Player's Retreat. It's there off of Oberlin. So all of their cooking oil, they, they you know, whether they're cooking hush puppies or, or chicken fingers or French fries, eventually that oil goes bad. The heat and the oxygen make the oil get kind of rancid and not taste good. So what you have to do then is you have to uh, dump that oil out and replace it with fresh oil, okay? Now, in our case, we don't wanna do that. We wanna take that oil in their, in their waste drum. We don't wanna throw it in the landfill. That's not a good, good use of it. We're gonna to go to that restaurant and we're gonna put it in some big, big tubs. We're gonna bring it back to our house and we're gonna take methyl alcohol. 
CH3OH. And we're also going to add a little bit of lye. Lye is sodium hydroxide. Those are your three ingredients that will make biodiesel. Look at that. Cakes are much more complicated than that. I'm going to take my fat. I'm going to add it to some methyl alcohol. Then I'm going to add a little bit of sodium hydroxide. And I'm just going to stir it up. And what this is going to do is it's going to break those three red long bonds. And it's going to make three new esters that are much smaller. One. Oh, sorry. Two. And three. By the way, those squiggly lines that you see there, that's a long aliphatic chain. CH3, CH2, 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 CH3, okay? 15 carbons long, 18 carbons long, 15, 18, all different long lengths. Some of these oils, by the way, have double bonds in them. Those are good fats. So something like olive oil, I could make olive oil into biodiesel. Oh, I forgot my uh, other ester there, sorry. Olive oil is a good healthy fat, whereas lard, completely saturated, no double bonds, that's a bad fat. So we have good fats and bad fats. Uh, you wanna stick to, you know, in terms of edible fats, you wanna stick to the healthy ones. So, you know, vegetable oils, uh, especially olive oil is a really good one. So I, I love olive oil, especially when I, when I live in Spain, they have some of the best olive oils. Well, okay, I, di I digress. So here's three molecules, three new molecules from this one giant one out here, the fat. What I show you in the blue is biodiesel. Look at how simple that was. My costs, how much does it cost for me to make this biodiesel? So to make one gallon of biodiesel cost me about 90 cents in ingredients. You know how much diesel fuel costs at the pump? Costs about $3.80 a gallon at the pump right now. So I've made a much cheaper fuel. What else about this biodiesel? Biodiesel compared to regular diesel has no aromatics. Remember that one class of molecules that I talked about at the very end of last class, the aromatics, there are none of that here. And therefore we don't get a lot of soot. So this is a much cleaner fuel, much less toxic. You could put biodiesel in your mouth, swirl it around and drink it. And you wouldn't, well, you probably have diarrhea, but you wouldn't get sick. Don't ever try that with regular diesel. If the diesel truck falls over and spills the diesel into the creek, you have likely killed a lot of wildlife, a lot of fish and plants in that creek or in that stream or in that lake. So biodiesel is very biodegradable. Wow, another plus for biodiesel. Here's another one. Biodiesel also has what we call high lubricity, lubrication. So if you burn biodiesel in your diesel tractor, in your truck, in your car, your car will last a lot longer because that fuel is much more slippery, much less heat. So my Mercedes, my 1980 Mercedes has 512,000 miles on it and it still purrs like a kitten. That's the great thing with biodiesel, a wonderful substitute for diesel. 
well, goodness, then why we have all this great things? Why are we not just get away with diesel and just use biodiesel? We don't have enough fat. There's not enough fat out there to replace all the diesel. So unfortunately, it's a supply and demand thing. If we could find a source of a lot of fat, um, we'd have our weight. Now we do get a lot of fat from chicken rendering plants, from hog farms, from uh, uh, soy farms. So there is a lot of fat out there, but not enough to replace all the diesel fuel. But you know, it's still, it's a viable fuel and, it, and it's one part of the environmental puzzle. So we should continue to use as much as we can these, these fuels uh, until we transition into other sustainable forms of transportation like uh, EVs and, and those sorts of things. But I tell you, I've been using it a long time and it works great. All right, I'm gonna pause now because I promised you last class that we're gonna do a little bit more practice with our drawing tool. So I now want to draw for you these complicated molecules on, on the, the, the chem sketch. And don't, don't, you don't have to open up your chem sketch. You can just follow me along. And then maybe this weekend, you can practice yourself drawing some more complicated molecules. So I'll stop this share and bring up chem sketch. Okay. Share screen. Chem sketch. Screen. Share. It's kind of small. Why is that so small? Let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger. Oh, here we go. Okay, that's better. All right, so let us draw a typical biodiesel molecule. Now I could do this um, using this tool here. You see this carbon atom? I could just go up and over and over and over and I can, I can just do that over and over again. So I could click a carbon and draw another carbon, 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 just keep going. What I got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh, dang. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. A 15 is good. C15. Now, I need to draw the ester part over here. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw another uh, bond here to a carbon atom but I'm gonna switch this carbon atom and turn it into an oxygen. How do you do that? Come over here and select oxygen from the tablet, then slide over to that carbon atom and click on it. It just turned it into an OH, okay? Now, I need to write an ester here. So I need to change that H into a CH3. Look, I forgot to unclick oxygen, that's okay. Just go to carbon, make that into a carbon atom. Now remember, I need a C double bond O coming off of this carbon to make the methyl ester. So I'm gonna choose carbon again, and I'm just gonna draw a double bonded carbon. How do, you, how do I draw a second bond here? Notice if I slowly hover between here and click on that. Look at that, just made a double bond. Now, come get the oxygen atom, turn that carbon into an oxygen atom. You have just drawn an ester. I know this R group is huge. Look at the size of this R group. And look at that molecule. How ugly is that? Oh. Let us try to clean that up a little bit. So I'm going to come down here a second, because. I've got some stuff up top that's interfering with my picture here. So you see, I have all of these tools that um, are at my disposal that I can, let's see if I can put that up, where can I put this? No, I'll just leave it up there for now. 
but I have a lot of these tools that I can use to clean up my drawings. So if you hover over it, it'll tell you what things are. So that's a rotating tool. Um, oh, I didn't want to do that. Clear that. Let me get my eraser. Uh, no, let's download that. Where's my eraser? Lasso. Well, I can lasso it too. Lasso it and delete it. Now, I need to make this pretty. What an ugly, ugly drawing this is. So they have these tools up here that you can use. You can export it, you can make it into a PDF, you can do a lot of things. I can open up templates, I can rotate things, I can flip them. Uh, let's see, where's my clean tool? Tools, here it is under tools. If I say clean structure, watch what's gonna happen to my drawing clean structure. Look at how pretty it looks now. I didn't have to redraw it, but it looks a lot prettier. So this is biodiesel. This is what I'm putting into my car. And it works great. I use it in my wife's tractor. I use it in her big truck. No, actually, I don't use it in her big truck uh, because uh, it's not warranted to use biodiesel. Uh, so her truck's kind of new. Now, just like before, if you want to see this thing, this big ester, this fatty acid ester in three dimensions, do you remember how to do that? So if you come up here next to this thing, oh, people are adding sleep. You see this pub chem? If you just go to the left, there's the 3D viewer. That's that second module that will take whatever structure is in your your drawing palette right here. So we're gonna take biodiesel and put it into my 3D viewer. This takes a minute. And again, your computer is gonna be a lot faster than mine. So you probably just barely blink and you, and you get this. Well, there's biodiesel right there. Now, just like before, you can view this in a lot of ways. I can view it just as sticks. There it is as sticks. I can view it as dots. Oh, look at that. Wow, that's beautiful. I can view it as space fill. Oh, spectacular. All right. Um, but for me, uh, I, I don't know. Maybe you're just particular. I just like the ball and stick view. Okay. Now, come over here where it says 3D optimization. What this does, it's going to arrange your molecule in the least energetic conformation. You don't know what that word means yet, conformation, but you will. Okay, so it actually, here it is in the, the least stressful 3D conformation. Now, if I wanna rotate this around and see it, now don't do this. Don't do the auto rotate change styles. You'll, you'll end up having a seizure because what happens is it keeps changing the molecule into the different balls and sticks, space fill, dots. Ugh, that's awful. Just go to this auto rotate. Click on that. Now, again, look at how slow mine is. You probably have a nice graphics card. If you do this, you're going to be flying. What I want you to notice is in the lowest energy conformation, look at that backbone of all of those carbon atoms. Do you see how it forms this zigzag? Up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Why is that true? Let me stop this real quick. To stop it, just click. The reason that it forms this zigzag conformation is it puts all of these uh, groups, these hydrogens away from each other. So they're not falling on top of each other because that's a high energy situation. Now, again, you can come over here and 3D rotate just by rotating it around. Again, yours, yours would be a lot faster than mine. 
and rotate it this way. I need to rotate it in the opposite direction a little bit. Okay, so a little bit better. All right. So you see here, here's the ester part. Here's the C double bond O, O, CH3. Then here's that long tail. If you had to guess, is biodiesel polar or nonpolar? Very nonpolar. Big, big, big nonpolar piece. Teeny little polar head group here, this ester, slightly polar. But notice there's no OH group here. And that's what really led to a high polarity. So that's one way to draw some really fancy molecules. There's our ester. Now, I, I do not care to save this. So I'm going to close this out. And I'm going to, I'm going to get rid of this too. I, I, I'm going to show you how to use the template tools on the right side. And we'll see that. So let me, let me just go ahead and lasso this whole thing and delete it. Okay. Now, let me take a carbon atom. And let me take, uh, let's see if I can take a nitro group. I just drew for you nitromethane, nitromethane. So here's the, here's the methane, and this is the nitro group, NO2. Notice nitromethane has an oxygen, a nitrogen that has a positive on it and an oxygen, which is a negative. Because the nitro group in organic structures like this, there's no way to form octets and have everything satisfied. That's why we have to have what we call formal charges. The positive nitrogen is a formal positive charge on the nitrogen. One of those oxygens is a negative charge, a formal negative charge. In actuality, those two oxygens are sharing part of that negative one. So it's really both of those oxygens are a minus 0.5, but that's for later on. We'll talk about that when we talk about resonance structures. All right, so here's nitromethane. Where do we see nitromethane? Let me show you. Stop share for a second. Share screen. Fuels. Where did I see those fuels? Let's go here. Was it here? Yeah. Oh, you know where it was? I remember where it was fuels. All right, so let me share my screen with you and share fuels. Screen, share, and fuels. Where'd it go? There it is. Let me go back. Talking about race fuels again. Let's see, was it up here? There's the methanol. Here it is. So you drag, drag lovers, you uh, high octane, uh, massive power, rebuild your engine every three races. Here's nitromethane racing fuel. Very important in drag racing. And the reason being, is the amount of power. Here's the equation here for nitromethane, CH3NO2. Here's the oxygen from the air. Now, if you take nitromethane and burn it, you make carbon dioxide, you make water, just like any hydrocarbon. Remember, when we, when we burned uh, methane, we got CO2 and water. But here's the difference with nitromethane. You get four moles of this other gas, nitric oxide. Now, this is not very, very good for the environment because it can lead to nitric, to acid rain. But, you know, how many dragsters do you know out there? Probably not many. So we're not, we're not pumping massive amounts of nitric oxide just because we're, we're driving funny cars and dragsters. So nitromethane is an extraordinarily powerful fuel 
because it's generating so much of this gas. And that gas corresponds to power. It's called a uh, propellant, okay? This nitromethane can burn without added oxygen, okay? You can burn nitromethane without the oxygen just by heating it up. And in doing so, look what happens to the nitromethane. You make carbon monoxide, you make hydrogen gas, and you make nitrogen. So you get sources of power from two different places, okay? Very, very powerful, but unfortunately, not very friendly to engines. So uh, that's why you have to rebuild these, these very, very powerful funny cars and, and dragsters all the time. So um, nitromethane, again, another fuel. Let's go back to our drawing of nitromethane and turn it into a three-dimensional structure and rotate it around and let you see some things about nitromethane. Okay, stop share. Share screen. Sketch. Not, not yet. Share screen. There it is. All right. So here's my nitromethane. I can go ahead and I, I can do a uh, a clean structure. All of, all of the clean structure is going to do for you. It's going to put those hydrogens out on the carbon atom. You see here how, oh, I didn't mean to do that. Sorry. Let me erase that. Get ahead of myself here. You see how these hydrogens are just shown as, as a CH3 group here? Watch what happens to this group when I come up here to tools and I say clean structure. Oh, it didn't do it. Usually it'll put the hydrogens out there. That's okay. It'll show it once we get to the three-dimensional structure. All right, so let's, let's go ahead and put this molecule into our three-dimensional di three drawer. So again, here's the pub chem. Just to the left of the pub chem is your 3D viewer. Okay, there's nitromethane, okay? This group here is the CH3. The light blue is the CH3. Here's the nitrogen, oxygen, oxygen. Notice both of those bonds are the same size, same length. Well, how is that possible? Wasn't one a double can't bond? Can't see the 3D. You can't see the 3D? Hmm, let's see, let me try this again. Let me see if I can go to screen share. Better? No, still can't see it. Anybody see that? Okay. We can see it now. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, so here's the nitromethane. This light blue, bond, light blue atom here is the carbon, so that's CH3. Here's the nitrogen. And if you ever want to know, look, look at how it changes. Is that a carbon? Well, just hover your mouse over it. Carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, oxygen. Now notice these two bonds are the same length. That's due to resonance. We haven't talked about resonance yet. When we drew the nitromethane out in the previous page, we had a double bonded oxygen and a single bonded oxygen. And you remember from general chemistry, Double bonds are shorter and stronger than single bonds. Single bonds are longer and weaker than a double bond. Triple bonds are the shortest and the strongest. A lot more energy in a triple bond. But we don't see that here. We see two bonds of equal length. And by the way, this length is not a double bond or a single bond. Both of those bonds are 1.5 units long. Now, you don't have to worry about that yet. We're gonna talk about that next week. 
we discuss resonance, but both of those are the same. Again, if you wish to rotate it, come over here and rotate your molecule. Again, you're gonna have much better success than me. So slow. I'm gonna steal my wife's laptop and let you see what, what a real computer can do when it's got a good graphics card. But look at the molecule, flat, very flat, very planar. Okay. See how all those are coplanar? Now, I'm gonna stop that rotate. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. Stop that rotate. And I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna rotate this by hand. No, not allow me to do it very easily. Come over here. Huh. Well, at any rate, your computer will work better than mine. I'm sure you must have a better graphics card than I do. Okay, now it just changed to atom types too on me. Did something crazy, sorry about that. Should just be a CH3 here, edit, uh, delete, uh, delete this. There we go. There's nitric oxide right there, NO. That's that gas that we saw from before. Nitric oxide is a very important gas that we're gonna see biology later on. Uh, but there's the simplest little nitrogen oxygen that uh, you would know very well if you had heart attacks. All right, so that's a, a way to get uh, that structure. I'm going to, I'm going to show you, share screen. Share. Okay, I'm going to show you a different molecule that's much more complicated. This will be the last one. Then you can go ahead and play. Do remember you got a homework that's going to be coming due on on Monday. I mean on Sunday. Uh, delete. delete. Last thing I want to show you are these templates here. See out here. This will automate a lot of drawing for you. So here's that benzene. And I'm gonna place that right there. So look at that. It saves you a lot of time in drawing the molecule by hand. Now, I can go ahead and put a cyclohexane and I can either do it one of two ways. Watch what happens as you slide that cyclohexane around. I can draw a link and make a single bond. I can fuse it to it, I can add a molecule like that. So look at, look at the kind of structures. I can take a, a tertiary butyl, you don't know what this means yet, T-butyl, and I can append it right there. I can make an ester, here's C double bond OCH3, and I can put an ester right there. Look at how fast that is. By using these template tools, and, and you've got more, by the way. You can make a lot yourself. Um, you can come up and, and choose different atom types if you want. I can change one of these into a nitrogen if I wish. I can put this into an oxygen if I wish. Very complicated, but still very beautiful. And again, uh, you can go ahead up to your tools. You can clean your structure. It's already should be pretty clean. Yeah, it is clean. All right, and then you can, again, paste this just like I did before. You can go ahead and put this into your 3D model, which I'm gonna do, and then hopefully share it correctly this time. So I'm gonna stop share, and then I'm gonna share, again, my screen with you, and hopefully you can see that. Look at how beautiful that is. Oh my, that's lovely. Okay, if you want to rotate it around, maybe you can rotate that a little bit. You can select atoms. If you want to highlight certain atoms you want to see in rotation, here's that benzene structure right here. 
I can stop that. I can come over here and rotate it using the machine. But again, this is gonna take a while because there's a lot of atoms. The more atoms you have, the slower it gets. So my, my computer's dragging really hard right here. Oh, that's lovely. Very powerful. I'm gonna stop that rotation. I'm gonna view it as sticks. Now, hopefully I can rotate this a little bit easier. This thing is select atoms. That's what. That's why they turned green. When I said select atoms, what I really meant to do was just do this. I'm gonna try to rotate this around again. There you go. So once you have just the sticks, you can rotate them around a little bit faster. Then you can go back to your ball and sticks because this is a lot more graphically intensive for the computer to deal with. So if you just want to uh, spin stuff around and not overload your system, go to the sticks or even wireframe is even, even faster. That you can rotate a lot. Uh, again, selecting atoms, you don't have to select these. You can unselect these or I can unselect that. I really don't care to select all these atoms. So I just unselected all those atoms. Oop, I didn't do it quite, quite well. Unselect. All right, so here's my molecule again, back in three, dim in three dimensions uh, as, a, as a wireframe, ball and stick. Uh, there we go. All right, so hopefully you now have the power to generate fairly complicated molecules. I know I made that look a little bit easier, but it's, it, you have to practice. So I need you to practice some of these because this is gonna be important for how you're going to generate structures for your project. Remember, we have a project in this class. 20% of your grade is gonna come from a project. We haven't discussed the project yet, but maybe at the tail end of next week, I'll send you the rubric about what elements I want to see in all of your projects that you'll submit. Now that these submissions are at the end of the semester. Um, but if you want to get it done earlier, that's fine too. Oh my, one o'clock. I'm so sorry. I didn't realize. Sometimes I start talking and I get, I get away from myself. All right, stop share. Very, very sorry about that. Um, hopefully I didn't make you miss a class or late for anything. Um, so uh, I know I've gone over, but I have, I have all the time you want. So if you want to ask me anything, you're, you're welcome to ask me anything. Uh, if not, if you have to run, I certainly understand that. Uh, I'll see you on, on Tuesday. And, but don't forget about me on Monday, on Sunday night. I'll send you, I'll send you an email to remind you about the homework. Okay. So hey, bye-bye everybody. Brown, I have a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, please. I've got all the time. Um, so our homework's usually going to be assigned Fridays and then do Sunday nights. You know, they're going to come kind of randomly depending upon how far I get, but typically very typically they're assigned friday and will be due monday nights on a typical basis not on sunday nights the only reason this week i have it due on sunday night is that monday they're coming to my house and they're going to redo my internet line uh i don't know if it's going to make it any better but i am going to lose contact for a while on monday night so i won't be able to see your homeworks so that's why i have it due sunday so um but typically you are correct. The homeworks come up on a Friday and they will be due the following Monday evening, okay? 10, 10 p.m., always 10 p.m. When's your next, uh, your next office hours will be Tuesday, right? Tuesday, 10 o'clock. Tuesday, 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, 10 to 11, 15. Because yeah. I'm gonna practice whenever I'm done with the homework course i'm going to try to practice a little more with the uh chem sketch program please but i was hoping maybe on the next office hours i could go over because it's still a little confusing to me on exactly where stuff's supposed to go and stuff like that oh yeah chem sketch is going to take you a while it, it's like any other skill you're going to have to get in multiple times and practice with it um but i'll tell you after about uh two weeks this will be second nature to you you won't even you won't even notice it so 
yeah, no problem. All right, yeah, because I just – I don't feel really confident on, like, I get where you click on stuff. I'm just – I don't know memorization of exactly how each molecule is supposed to look and stuff like that. Yeah. You know I mean? Right. Don't, don't memorize too much stuff. This is not a class where there's a lot of memorization. It's more about explaining why I, I am much more concerned about the whys than you knowing a bunch of facts ad nauseum, you know, why is biodiesel better than regular diesel? That's the kind of stuff I like, not, could you draw for me a biodiesel molecule? I won't ever do oh. that. That that's just okay. that's just a waste of our time for this kind that's of a what class. I'm about. This yeah. is a class where we're looking at broad strokes. We're looking at big picture stuff. That's what we really want. Uh, we're not really interested in you know. Okay, could you name for me the first ten alkanes? Oh, okay. Just like memorizing the state capitals. Remember you had to do that when you were in grammar school? What are all the state capitals in the United States? My teachers used to do that to me every year. What a waste. I just look it up in a book. Why do I have to fill my head with all the state capitals? That doesn't do you any good. Memorizing yeah. facts. Facts without content is, is bogus. You know, there are a few facts you got to know. Okay, there's some, some little facts, but I, I tell you what to know. Uh, you don't have to worry about that before the test. I specifically tell you, know what isotope is, know what allotrope is, know what carbon electron configuration is. I tell you that. So just, yeah. just okay, that stuff you just know. But so just practice, and that'll make it that'll make it second nature. Absolutely, and and I tell you, once you once you. Once you see the first test and the first few homeworks, you're gonna see that this class is much more about what I want out of you is more about um, broad knowledge and, and knowing how things and why things work. Why, why, why? If, you, if there's nothing else in this class that you get out of, why do things happen? Why do organic reactions work? Why does, any, why, does, why does anything in nature happen the way it does? Well, if it's spontaneous, it's, it has to be a downhill energy process, right? So if it's not spontaneous, like photosynthesis, right? You're taking carbon dioxide and water and you're making these very complicated structures. You're gonna make glucose from carbon dioxide and water. Then you're gonna, then the plant is gonna take the glucose and it's gonna polymerize it, gonna make a polymer. And sometimes it's gonna make cellulose. Sometimes it's gonna make glu uh, uh, amylose, you know, starch, amylose is starch. And so basically that's an uphill process, right? I know you yeah. biochemists that you, you biology people, you call it endogonic, right? Is that the term you use, something like that? We call yeah, it, so we call it, we call it endothermic. Chemistry, <laughs> this is a chemistry class. So if you're going up the energy hill, that's an endothermic reaction. Energy has to be supplied. So where does the energy come to, for photosynthesis? The sun, right? If we didn't have the sun, we wouldn't have photosynthesis. All the plants would die. You and I would die. And that would be the end of end of us. Are there organisms that don't need the sun? Yeah, there are some organisms that can get their energy from sulfur. Microorganisms that are way underneath the ocean, but that's not us. We have to have the sun to survive. We need photosynthesis. Without it, we're dead. All right. All right. Well. I'm going to do the home. I'm going to grab some lunch and then possibly start trying the homework or the chem sketch. <laughs> Good job. Good job. Homework won't be up till tomorrow, but do the chem sketch. All right. Sounds great. Bye all. If you got another hey, question, man. I'm still here. So if you got another one, just let me know. Yes. Um, are we going to need access to the chem sketch program during class time or only after class? No, 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 no. Just, just the chem sketch is more for your project. 
but I, I need you to get used to ChemSketch before you start uh, crafting your project because your project is going to incorporate molecules. Now, um, no, no, you don't have to pull up ChemSketch unless you just want to. Uh, you know, if you got a, a, a second laptop or an iPad next to you, you want to do it there, that's, that's fine, no problem. Uh, but you, you don't have to, no. I won't ever ask you to do ChemSketch during class. Thank you. Anybody else got one? Okay. Okay. Well, if not, then I will see everybody on Tuesday for office hours and or lecture. Hasta luego.